was it a good thing that india was colonized by the british my arguments uh, british were less brutal marginally less brutal than spain spanish or belgians being a colony saved us from being a direct rival of other powers being in the british kept us under low profile a strong india would have kept uh, created a separate pole to crush this non vedic civilizations would have etc and our colonial legacy the english language is a blessing in disguise as it is the global language of technology and culture this may prove to be our greatest strength in exporting our culture to the rest of the world so pritish i i i respect what you say this is what many many people believe that's what many people i know believe this you know so i i have a different viewpoint so let me uh, invite you to understand that let me offer my viewpoint to this i disagree with uh, the uh, arguments that you have presented so let me explain why i disagree so um see all colonizers are brutal whether it's the spanish or the belgians or the british i mean the british killed more than 100 million indians in artificially engineered famines i don't think the spanish have been that brutal anywhere I don't think the Belgians have been that brutal. They killed about 10 million people in the Congo in about uh, a few uh, few decades. But the the way the British killed so many Indians in artificially engineered famines and these this this figure of 10 million it's just basically British figures. The actual figures may have been much much higher. So people say that uh, they don't believe when I say that the British killed 10 million people. So let me let me just briefly show you a timeline of famines in india this is from wikipedia first of all please understand that i do not support wikipedia i don't advocate wikipedia as a reliable source wikipedia is very problematic i'm just showing it in wikipedia for the sake of uh, convenience and time so you can see how many famines were there in india 1979 2 to 10 million 1783 11 million 11 here 1 here 2 million here 1 million here 1 and 1/2 million here uh something else here 5 and 1/2 million here 5 million here etc 4.5 million there 1.5 million here and that's just a few and these are all grossly underestimated figures they don't first of all include the numbers who died from epidemics because of of the malnutrition and all that and these numbers are grossly under underestimated because these are british figures you cannot rely on british figures you cannot rely on the figures given you given to you by your occupiers okay so they killed at least 100 million people just by starving them to death slowly systematically bureaucratically and they killed more than 10 million people in the immediate aftermath of 1857 the first war of independence their brutality was unmatched and unparalleled okay so we can't say that the british were less brutal marginally or otherwise than any other occupier than any other colonialist all colonialists are the same they 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 don't care about anyone's human rights so that's, that's the first thing a strong india india would have created a separate pole a strong india is what is required if you are weak you are invisible but that's not good right if you are strong you will have enemies that's the that's that comes with the territory of being strong we must be strong if you are strong you will have enemies and you need to know how to deal with that that is called being strong if you are economically powerful but you don't have a military then you are not strong and you are inviting big big trouble so it is for a country a civilization of india's size and magnitudes it is imperative it is essential it is i mean you have to be strong okay there there, there is no other alternative to being strong india has to be strong a separate pole crush this non vedic civilizations if you are strong enough no one can crush you so once again i can't agree with that our colonial legacy india's uh, the english language is a blessing in disguise we will export indian culture sanskrit <laughs> via english so look i'm not trying to make fun of you or to uh, or that you know my point is that okay let let me show you some some data right uh, see if if english is such a big advantage then why do facts bear something else out so uh, let me show you some some statistics right okay let me get rid of the question so these are the statistics of the top 10 countries in the world by nominal gdp these are the top top 10 largest economies in the world 
the United States, China, Japan, Germany, India, UK, France, Italy, Brazil, Canada. Out of this, the United States, the UK, and Canada are English-speaking countries. Look at the other countries. China. They don't use the English language. They, their education system is in Chinese. Japan, the world's most technologically advanced country, doesn't use English. It offers education only in Japanese. The Japanese language has not prevented them from becoming the number one technologically advanced nation in the world. Germany, one of the most industrialized nations and one of the most technologically advanced nations, again, they don't use English. They use the German language in education and in, and in everything. France, I mean, come on. The French will never ever use English. It did not prevent them from building this brilliant uh, technology. The Rafale planes, the nuclear reactors, and, and much more technology, right? Italy doesn't use English. Once again, technologically advanced. Brazil, not so advanced, but still has some self-respect, doesn't use English. And look at, of all these countries, the GDP per capita, whose is the lowest? It is India, with its English advantage, whose GDP per capita is the lowest. And, and it doesn't, this, this list doesn't even include Russia, which is so advanced in, the, in terms of technology and science. They don't use English, they use Russian. So does English confer any kind of advantage? That's a myth. And, and about English being a language of culture, the English language, uh, my friends, uh, does not even have its own script. The English language does not even have its own written script, its own alphabet. It uses the Latin script. Do you realize that? The script, the, the alphabet that's used to write the English language is a foreign language alphabet it's the latin alphabet and it's it's the it's the one alphabet that's been imposed upon most of europe so that's the uh, that's the kind of poverty that you find in the english language it's not in any way a superior language it's an inferior language sanskrit is the most advanced language sanskrit is the language of culture okay and it's also the language of technology india would never have i mean india did not have english in the harappan era and yet it was the most technologically and scientifically advanced civilization in the history of humanity at the time. Our ancient mathematicians, our ancient scientists, Brahma Gupta, Arya, Arya Bhatt, uh, Madhava of Sangramagam, and so many more. Did they use English to develop uh, differential calculus, integral calculus, uh, trigonometry, and much more? Did they use English to develop astronomy and all the sciences and all the technology? It was all done with Sanskrit. So we need to get over this mental colonization that all of us have, including me too. I'm talking to you in English. So we need to find ways of getting over this. English does not provide us with any advantage. It actually hampers us. It keeps us back. We are forced to converse in English right now because half the country can't even speak Hindi. And Hindi is something I'll come to later on in this program. So my respectful uh, Invitation to everyone is please try and think differently. English does not provide any advantage. The British colonialism was in no way great for us or good for us. They, would, they did not come here to, to uplift us from our, from, our, from our backwardness. We were not backward when they came here. We were backward when they left. We were impoverished, impoverished and destroyed as a nation when they left. They came here because there was something to take from here. Right? So, and, and the British occupation of India. I mean, people say that the British gave us so much. They gave us so much. They gave us railways for the sake of the gods. Railways and ports and roads and infrastructure and wonderful buildings. And the judiciary for good, for good God. All of that. Why did they create the railways? The railways were the infrastructure of occupation and extraction. They built railways so that they could extract wealth out of India. They bought, built ports so that they could have ships come and dock over here, take goods from the railways and get out and take away our wealth. And these ports and roads and railways were built with Indian money using Indian labor. It was built with wealth extracted out of India. It was built with slave labor taken from Indians. Right? Please, please try and see things in the proper context. The judiciary they created wa was basically for their own benefit. It treated Indians like second-class citizens. 
Indians did not get the same treatment as the British in the in the British judiciary. And it's interesting to note that it's the same judiciary that's still there today. Nothing has changed in the structure and the functioning um, of the judiciary, in the architecture, internal architecture of the judiciary. It's the same institution. It's the same institutions that we are still carrying forward today. It's, a st- it's, a, it's the same laws that the British wrote that are still g- ruling us. So India needs to decolonize. It, it's high time India decolonizes. And we cannot decolonize unless we realize how deeply colonized we are. So I urge you, I invite you all to think deeply about this. And try and try and figure out the different ways in which we are colonized because India is still a very much a colonized country. So first we have to realize it if you want to break free from those self-imposed shackles.